daydream. Right? That's what we need. Right? What do you think? very potent place. Yeah, because daydream is, you didn't manufacture the daydream any more than you manufactured the dream. Now they're equally thought-provoking, opening up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what? I don't know about oh. daydreams. You don't know? I guess I do know about daydreams, but um, How would you do one? Well, look here. There are five kinds of daydreams. So the one that's most interesting to us is the tangent daydream. See? Now, we're going to be doing some work tonight, right, reading and talking. Uh, it, it, perhaps it's even thought-provoking to try to work through one of these things we have here. Hey, if you get a thought that interrupts what you're doing in trying to understand this work, that's a daydream. Any tangent that pulls you away from what you want to do, that's what we want to look at. Look here, just for a moment. The daydream is the whole problem of enlightenment and unenlightenment. It's, it's, all, it's all in this one thing. Look here. Here's the beginning of the daydream. Here's the end. Every daydream of this type always has and starts with a self-image. A very peculiar self-image. You identify with it so completely that everything else is eclipsed. You identify with it so completely that you allow what's inherent in that image, what's inherent in that image, to play itself out If you allow it to go through its normal cycle and there's nothing that interrupts it, you will always find that it ends here where you recognize it produces a failure. That failure is the recognition that this self-image is false and you can reject it. That's not me. Now, when it occurs, you want to know as close as you can get what was happening just that moment before it began. And you want to know what was it like, the state of mind, at the conclusion when you woke up so this is really falling asleep. And this is waking up. But since it's falling asleep to a false image of yourself, and you're waking up to its falsity, this is really waking up on a higher level, which is akin to a state of, a momentary state of enlightenment.
as this is the introduction to ignorance, personal ignorance. So when that occurs, you want to study where the heck did, where did that image come from that you identified with and allowed this drama to play itself out? And then, ideally, you want to link it with your dreams because they play, they play a corresponding role. Right? So with dreams, pay attention to daydreams. The closer you are to the one to the other, you'll see that this is always fitting to the dream. Only this one shows you the dream simply in terms of the self-image playing itself out. So, watch, right the first moment that interruption comes, right? So, we pass this, please. Do you mean even simple things like, I better make sure I get my daughter's soccer gear together tonight so that when we wake up at 6.30 in the morning, uh, we'll be ready to go to the game at 7. Like those kind of thoughts, like your mind is just like reminding you to take care of things. Are those tangents too? No, no, that's a different kind of daydream. With these are interruptions of some intellectual process that's meaningful to you, that in breaks it. Okay. Huh? So like this. Uh, there's situ situ yeah, what you're calling a situation daydream, like uh, if, if you decide to, that your job, as it were, is to do the dishes or some chore, okay. the dramas that attend that are likely to be daydreams, and that's the meaningful part of the activity, and you want to pull them out and look at it, but those are situation daydreams. Right, this one is tangents from a given activity that's meaningful. Right. Oak? All right. What do we got here? Perhaps you should take a few minutes to take a look at it. Let me suggest something. Uh, This work, this guy, this guy has done a beautiful job of describing what happened to him when he decided to study a work just by itself. Look. saying to himself, you know what I want to do? I want to study Heraclitus. I want to do a, such a job of it that I want to cover everything that's, everything he said that I can find from every source. Then I want to discover everybody who has written about him in the past. I want to collect all of those together so I can pull together the original statements of Heraclitus and all the statements that people in the classical world said about him. That's called the doxe, right? Doxographical, or what I call opinions or gossip or whatever someone wants to call you. That's the game of doxology. Okay. So he finds there are about 123, 124 original statements. And he's got a basket full of comments about them, about Heraclitus. And all he's doing is putting those together and trying to make sense of what Heraclitus is really saying. 
he ran into so much difficulty among fellow scholars that he noted all of their arguments against what he's doing. So these are the arguments against what he's doing. They thought he was nuts. Because everybody agrees that Heraclitus doesn't make any sense. He's contradictory. He said, that's not... He said, these, the arguments against him, the, the ways of thinking that people attributed to him, these are all myths. You can't understand anybody with these views. So he's cataloging all of the scholars' views that are in print that put Heraclitus down as not significant or of minor significance or of compromising his, his integrity. So he's going to review all of these. And in doing that, he's going to name the crisis in scholarship when you're trying to do something just with an author, what we do, just stay with the author and try to understand the author. You see, there's a whole war against that kind of thinking in the classical world. You can't do that. And that's what the article is covering. And so it's a lifetime work. He did all of this work. He's now coming out with the complete volume of Heraclitus, never before ever done, but with a fresh translation. And that's his goal. So here he sh you can see the summary and the difficulty he has had. Ah, let me take your page. The first three pages up to 198. Now, then he gives a bunch of quotes, and of course he puts them in Greek, so therefore everybody can understand it. Yeah, that's normal, isn't it? In our culture, most people... Greek, Greek, classic Greek, yeah. And he makes uh, some very, very interesting and fundamental ideas about Greek, about Greek thought, which is really curious and interesting. And um, so take a look. Okay, take a few minutes out and I'll get my copy. I didn't go on.
Well, he then develops, he then develops his own way of proceeding and um, there are five principles he uses And that is on page 208. Okay. So if you go to 208, let me just hit them for you. All right. He says, if you want to do classic thinking, right? If you want to do classical work trying to understand classical authors, especially Heraclitus, he says, the principle of, of precaution, right? He links these four, though he adds another one of his own, on 208. These are the very important working principles, the principle of precaution, the presumption of innocence, the rule of non-identity of almost similar texts. Last of all, the dangerousness of, excess of excessive confidence and the preliminary results of modern qualification, which is uh, that's a language they speak in Brooklyn. Okay. Hey, the first principle of question, if you're going to start working on Heraclitus. Right. You can't really say anything about him until you've got the whole work. Don't settle just for a cue. So his first is, hey, make sure you study the whole before you start your analysis, right? Master the whole. Therefore, be cautious about making any kind of conclusion before you've done the whole. The presumption of innocence. Right? You have to assume that you, unless you're, you have to start with the assumption that you're completely ignorant of who Heraclitus is and what he said. You have to walk into it with a clean slate. You have to have a sense of innocence about the thing. So the principle of innocence is, hey, uh, approach it with, with uh, a sense of integrity, right? You're not going to quickly interpret things there's a sense of innocence. So, uh, hold back, respect the work. The second principle consists of not only in granting the benefit of doubt to anything which may look false or incorrect or biased, but in addition, accepting advance as an axiom requiring no proof, the opposite presumption, which is what? That the innocence, exactness, intelligence, the competence, the faithfulness to the original, and, and honesty of the cider must be assumed. What do you have to assume? Hey, <laughs> assume the author is intelligible and has integrity to make it short, all right? So assume has his own integrity and he's writing because he wants to share something honestly with you. He said, that's what he calls it. Hey, um, the, the recommendation next of the non-identification of similar texts. Um,
Now, this is a curious one, but he gives an example of it. Um, when you're dealing with different quotes and they look like they're the same or saying the same, spot the differences. That's it. Look for the difference in similar quotes so that you can then appreciate why he's going on beyond saying the particular thing he's saying and keeps adding. Look for the differences. And appreciate the differences among similar quotes. Um, hyper, hyper sensitivity or hyper skepticism. Um, you have to assume that even uh, even the most, uh, if someone is making errors in the work that you're reading, even the most erroneous or dishonest. To be more correct, to consider the philosopher's archaic views that must be based on some knowledge. He must have had some knowledge even if he made a mistake. That is to say, in terms of modern thought, we might look at an ancient thinker and say, well, he was wrong there about that. His point is, hold on, see? It must be based upon some knowledge that he had, no matter how accurate it was. Therefore, try to understand the background from which the so-called era emerged. Right? Which means what? How would you put it? Appreciate the, the points of view of the author and recognize it comes from his own source of knowledge. It may be different from yours, but respect his, right? So, respect his sources, whether you think they're right or wrong, and learn from what knowledge he made his conclusions. Right? Find what it was based upon. Read between the lines. Pardon? Like, read between the lines. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now he adds his own. These are the four. Um, the fifth principle, that is, of the necessary completeness of any reconstruction. that whatever you're doing, hey, whatever you're doing with these authors, you have to be complete in whatever reconstruction you're doing. You must be able to have a wide enough vision to see what he's doing and bring it all together. Right. Or hold fast to the unity of the work because there has to be a necessary completeness of any re con reconstruction you're making of the works. So hold fast to the unity of the works. By the way, this is called revolutionary. This guy is revolutionary. He spent his life with Heraclitus and he had to face all of these great critics and he lists all of them, the formal ones. And he's deviating from what they do. And he wants to point out to you that what they're doing is nonsense. 
that this is the only way to treat a text. So you can see it's far different than what we do. <laughs> right? That's what we do. That's the way we approach the text. So we're finally becoming revolutionary. No, oh, Quran or modern, modern. Edge. All right. And we have we have a friend among us all, and his work on Heraclitus. He he uh, did the first volume. There are five volumes. First volume, you can pick up if you know anyone who knows Russian because it's in Russian. <laughs> so it's going through translations. All right, so I thought you'd like to uh, yeah, very know that we're... Now look here. Hold it. I just wanted to say that as you, as you took us through that, Ian, there's something about it that reminds me of everything you, you, you taught us at Golden West and on Friday nights here about I'm not teaching philosophy, I'm just teaching how to read. Mm. And, and you've also added how to listen. Mm -hmm. And what it seems to me what you found is a guy who's saying, I'm, I'm going to do that. <laughs> and he's revolutionary. And that makes him revolutionary, right? <laughs> <laughs> and his criticism of the university is so severe that in the text, if you read the whole thing, you'll see that he cautions, he cautions himself that he better not state it as fully as he feels it. <laughs> because as far as he's concerned, there are many universities that are just biased and what they're doing there is just a waste of time. So look here. To keep these in mind, look what we do, see? We go through a work and we are going to hunt for, is there an order? To know that though, you have to look for repeating themes. And then you want to see if there are connections between these themes that together link up with other themes. Why? Because after we do all of this, we want to know this big question. Who cares what they thought? We want to make sure we can see if we can learn something that is philosophically significant to us. So all of this work finally comes back down to you. So, if you have a pre-Socratic, um, I thought I would uh, play with it for a while. Um, Now, what's interesting, again, um, this work is rare because uh, on a very small level, he's doing exactly what Wheelwright is doing, which is he puts all the text together Then he has, then he has pages that follow in a special category. First he says, we're going to pull out from Aristotle everything he said about, about Heraclitus. Then we're going to go for what he calls early Greek or later Greek, at this time he uses later Greek sources. And you can see um, 
that he then quotes many, many people, uh, and it's very beautifully what he does, and he gets uh, at last our Latin sources. That's exactly what's being offered by our author, only he does a complete job. Paraclita, pardon me, Wheelwright. Uh, there are about 125 original quotes from Heraclitus, and uh, actually 124. And then he has at least put all those together. He has about 100 quotes from these other three sources. Now he says, "Look here, if you want to understand this man, you have to do what he suggested." So first, you know what he left out? He left out what moderns think of Heraclitus and all the scholarship on Heraclitus. Same thing he's doing. He says, the hell with scholarship. Waste of time. Right? He said, hey, forget what scholars have done with it. Therefore, he's following this, they're following the same method that we use when we're taking a look at those. Now, uh, Okay? In order to play the game, you have to then do this kind of thing. You mustn't do. You have to link them all together. So, you know, everyone ends up saying, you know, Heraclitus believed you can't stand in the same river twice, right? And everything is fire and all the, uh, these rather curious statements. But what he's really doing is exploring the Logos. He has a very sophisticated idea of the Logos. Now, Wheelwright doesn't collect them together, so you have to find all of them and just line them up, see, line them up. And then you want to know, hey, uh, what effect is that going to have on the soul? Uh, if someone thinks the way Heraclitus thinks, how will he then look at people around him? Then you want to know, hey, on the highest level, what is his view of wisdom and the gods? Now, if you do that, you'll see that you can line up the works and look at the way this guy starts. <clears throat> Although the Logos is eternally valid, yet men are unable to understand it. Not only before hearing it, but even after they've heard it for the first time. That is to, that is to say, although all things come to pass in accordance with the Logos, Men seem to be without any experience of it. At least, you know, if they're be judged by uh, uh, the way they function, right? 
if they're judged in the light of such words and deeds as I'm going to set forth. Now look here. I want to let you know my own method, which is going to be the logos, okay? My own method, he says. My own method is to distinguish each thing according to its nature and to specify how it behaves. Other men, on the contrary, are as neglectful of what they do when awake as when they are asleep. Okay, what's his method? You have to distinguish each thing that you're studying, right? Each thing according to its nature and specify how it behaves. What are we doing here? We looked at each thing in the dream. Right? We wanted to see its nature and then see how it functions or behaves. behaves. Between the two, you can then finally reach meaning as you draw it from the subject. You don't have to know anything. Right? So the very, uh, the very principle in dream work that we do is akin to and follows the same method of Heraclitus. Look. Second quote, look here. We should not, <laughs> we should not let ourselves be guided by what is common to all, yet, although the Logos is common to all, most men, men, most men live as if each had a private intelligence of their own. <laughs> but things are to me what I think to me, and there are to you, such as they believe you, and who's to say who's right or wrong, since everyone has their own intelligence, right? All right, now, he's going to mix it up. See, he's going to mix it up. I'm going to go to the third. That's going to be... Men who love wisdom should acquaint themselves with a great many particulars. Hmm. Fine. But we don't know what he means by what set of particulars, since each of these is separate. So you have to hold on to it and make no conclusions as you build up a meaning that is broad enough to include them all under the proper category. Look here. Again, looks like he's shifting. Seekers after gold dig up much earth and find very little. Again, he's making a contrast between himself and other people. See? That's a a big theme, see? So you, you know them. Now, look here. All through the 124 of them, there are going to be quotes that jump all around. So you have to gather them together in a net that seems to you most similar and then look for their differences. Is that what he's saying? So look. What do you do with this now? Huh? Human nature has no real understanding. Only the divine has it. Hey, do dreams show us a kind of intelligence 
that we have to fish out to appreciate? Yeah. Is it a noble kind of intelligence? Absolutely. That can show something important that you never would have suspected without the dream? Yep. Hey, human nature has no understanding. Only the divine nature has it. Yeah. Hey, man is not rational. There's an intelligence only in what encompasses him. Hmm. See, all of these are, uh, these are great little statements, so you knit them together. That's a good bumper sticker. Yeah. I like that last is that, one. Yeah. yeah. What fragment is that here? Oh, this is 61. <laughs> um. That would get people thinking. Yeah. Okay, watch. Another one, similar in the same class. <laughs> what is divine? escapes men's notice because of their incredulity, mm -hmm. right? Because of their beliefs, mm -hmm. right? Think that's true? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> you go along with him. I do. God, maybe you'd go along with the dude. <laughs> ah! Hey, now he's on 64. It's on the Logos, so you have to then connect that with the other Logos, don't you? Mm. Here it is. Although intimately connected with the Logos, men keep setting themselves against it. There's a conflict in them over the Logos. Ah. Yeah. Like, Which one? Well, I mean, it's good at pointing out how we lack, but like, how about giving us some instructions on how to get into it more? Yeah, that's right. Like, um, I, I want to know more about the intimate connection. Don't you grab it? Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, men. Men should speak with rational awareness and thereby hold on strongly to that which is shared in common. As a city holds on to its laws, and even more strongly. For all human laws are nurtured by the one divine law, which prevails as far as it wishes and suffices for all things, and yet, is something more than they are. Now, is there a spiritual dimension to this? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, you're going to get it. Um, hey, what's law? Law involves obeying the counsel of the one. Uh, to me, one man is worth 10,000 if he's first raised. Okay, let's go to the higher ones. Ready? The hidden harmony is better than the obvious. People do not understand how that which is at variance with itself agrees with itself. There's a harmony in, a, in bending back as in the case of the, bow, of the bow and the lyre. Now watch where he goes. Wisdom is one and unique. It's unwilling and yet willing to be called by the name of Zeus. He's putting mythology together with wisdom and the idea of the one in one sentence. So then he pushes the next one. Wisdom is one. 
to know the intelligence by which all things are steered through all things. So that one goes with the logos, because the logos is what goes, as it were, is the dynamic behind all things that produces and is the cause of its order. It is one and the same thing to be living and dead, awake or asleep, young or old. To be in agreement is to differ. The concordant is the disconcordant. For from out of all the, the many particulars comes oneness. And out of oneness comes all the many particulars. Remember when we had the question about why we use the word particulars? Mm -hmm. Now you can link it, mm -hmm. right? So it's linking all of these things together. And you can play. You have to play with it. And everyone then can come together and they can share what it is they found. And you can benefit by one another's constructions. But it's likely you'll have similar, similar themes. If for no other reason than the number of them as well as their importance. So let me give a couple of more. Um, the immortals become mortals. Mortals become immortals. They live in each other's death and die in each other's life. Uh, there await men after death such things as they neither expect nor have they any conception of. How can anyone hide from that which never sets? People, they pray to images, much as if they were to talk to houses, for they do not know what gods and heroes are. worthwhile getting in the book and uh, cooking with it. So I thought we'd share that for tonight. Right? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Now it's time for a cup of coffee. So it's about 20 pages. So it's about 20 pages. Yeah. Including the testimony. Yeah. No, I'm just wondering if everybody can oh. get a hold of it. Yeah, if you don't have a copy, we can make Xeroxes and pass them around. How many copies do you want? 20 pages of... You'll do it? Of pre-Socratic, 69 to 89, I think oh. is yeah. 20 days. Yeah, okay. Oh, for next time? Yeah. For next Friday? Yeah. Well, no, we're going to go... Yes, bring it for next Friday, but we'll do something else next Friday. Go ahead. We will. Okay. Oh, and then people could take it home and be, it'd be a project. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, because I was trying to figure out how we can get it to people before then. But if we're not going to do it next no, Friday, then... No, it's going to take a little while. Oh, yeah.